in our ever-increasing technological world, with all the advancements, there are security issues. Today, ransomware is one of the number one leading threats in the digital age. Hospitals, governments, and personal computers all fall under attack from ransomware. Today, we are talking with Greg Edwards, the creator of Crypto Stopper. Crypto Stopper is what you need to protect you in this digital age. Let's listen to Greg explain to us about ransomware and Crypto Stopper. To overcome, you must educate. Educate not only yourself, but educate anyone seeking to learn. We are all dead America. We can all learn something. To learn, we must challenge what we already understand. The way we do that is through conversation. Sometimes we have conversations with others. However, some of the best conversations happen with ourselves. Reach out and challenge yourself. Let's dive in and learn something right now. Would you please introduce yourself and tell people exactly what you do, Greg? Sure. So I'm Greg Edwards, and I've been in the technology field since uh, the late 90s, which kind of shows my age. <laughs> um, but the the latest company that I've started is called Crypto Stopper. And what we do is detect and stop ransomware that's actively running on a business network. So um, my, my background is in technology, and, and I've started three different technology companies, uh, starting out in 1998 with a, a managed services business that I actually still own today. Uh, but in, in 2002, I started an offsite backup and disaster recovery company that we started seeing in 2012, started seeing these ransomware attacks happening. And that happened to coincide with Bitcoin coming out. Uh, and so what transpired and what, what's happened is that because of Bitcoin, it's allowed cyber criminals to get paid completely anonymously. And that's why the, the cyber crime that we have today has exploded so much. Um, so as far as my background, um, I've, I've been a technologist pretty much all of my life uh, and have started several different technology companies, the latest being Crypto Stopper. Right now, here in my local area, and I guess quite a few areas, just got hit with the Raikou strain of ransomware. And it yeah. was spread through a Google document. So our hospital yep. is shut down right now due to ransomware. Could you explain to us what ransomware actually is? Sure. Uh, if fundamentally, all all ransomware is is just a an encryption method that holds files hostage, basically. So, if you think about if you've ever used an application like WinZip or Seven Zip that that compress and encrypt a file then that's exactly what ransomware does. They've just taken, these criminals have taken that technology to take an encrypt and put a password on, an, on a file and taken that to the next level where they encrypt everything on a network and then hold that password as the, as the ransom. And so to get access back to your files, you either have to recover from from backup uh, or rebuild or pay the ransom. I mean, those really, I mean, once it's run and the files have been encrypted, that's the only way to get access back to, to those files. I read that there's uh, different types of ransomware. 
could you explain to us a little bit about that? Sure. So uh, the the incident that you're you're talking about with Ryuk probably actually started out as a malware called TrickBot. Uh, so there and there are thousands of variants of ransomware out there, but this TrickBot malware within the Ryuk ransomware variant is the most common right now and the FBI actually sent out a a warning just yesterday specifically to healthcare providers and hospitals uh that that there is an imminent threat and I mean it's been happening it's been happening for years but right now in particular this this group is this Eastern European um, cyber criminal group is specifically targeting hospitals. And Ed, if you um, so so we maintain on our website we maintain different decryptors for ransomware variants, and I think at the last count we were a little over twelve hundred different variants that we have identified. Uh, so. So this wow. is something that it's not like there are just a couple out there. I mean, there there's probably a dozen that are the most common, um, but there are well at least twelve hundred different variants, and and certainly more than that. That's just mind blowing. Wow. So who's the main target of these attacks? Well, so there's really not one specific target. Um, Hospitals, obviously, right now, are a are a target. But I mean, I've worked with with companies, everything from um, hospitals, manufacturing, law firms, insurance companies. I mean, it, it's across the board. Uh, the the targeted attacks on these hospitals. I I don't know the exact reasoning behind that and uh, other than the potential for just chaos and causing even more problems during um, during COVID and that they think that potentially they'll get paid faster because the hospitals will want to be back up and running faster, which I, I, you know, that to me is, is, I mean, it's disgusting but that seems to be the motivation right now. Unfortunately. So why doesn't our regular antivirus software stop ransomware attacks? So it's a great question. And actually just earlier this week and still right now, we're dealing with a law firm uh, that the, it, this, our system actually stopped the ransomware attack that, that was happening that got through the antivirus. So as you as you can imagine, these variants with that many different variants coming out and they change the way that those, what they call a signature file of the individual variants changes on a minute by minute basis. So antivirus just can't keep up with the number of changes that are happening. And so like this law firm that that we're we're working working with right now, um they had our product and it stopped the ransomware attack, but we're digging in to see you know how exactly did it get through. The the way that it initially looks, a uh, user clicked on an attachment with an email that was a word document, opened that, it ran, the antivirus actually caught part of it and notified the the user but it really looks like that was just obfuscation to like make the user think that something was stopped but it was actually still running in the background and then that's where our application kicked in and saw that ransomware was actively trying to run and stopped it so I'm not I'm not sure if that completely made sense, but it basically the short answer is it it's changing so fast that the antivirus can't keep up. Okay, you you actually answered a little bit more about my next question is how your software 
helps people prevent attacks. To, to back up even further, um, I mentioned that with the offsite backup company that I previously owned and we started seeing ransomware attacks happening as far back as 2012. And the, the core of what ransomware does is encrypt files. So it, antivirus wasn't stopping it. I mean, antivirus has never stopped every single variant of malware that comes out i mean there would be no you know if it did these cyber attackers wouldn't uh wouldn't still exist because they wouldn't be able to make any money but some of those attacks have always gotten through and so what we did at the offsite backup company is built a tool that would deploy bait files essentially throughout a network so that when an attack, when a ransomware attack started running and got out onto the, the network and was actively encrypting files, that we would be able to detect that separately from antivirus. And, and it, it, eventually it made sense to sell the offsite backup company and ransomware was becoming such a problem that we took that kind of very uh, simplistic tool that we built and turned it into a full application that now companies can buy, download, and, and install on their network. But at the core of what it does is it puts bait files out on the network. So when those files are encrypted, then we take automated action on whatever process it is that's running that encryption. Good way to stop an attack. So does Crypto Stopper run on any server, and how heavy is the software to deploy on your server? Yep, so it's actually very light, um, and it, it's server-based and desktop or laptop-based, and we're actually in the process of creating um, cloud, cloud drive variants, so OneDrive, um, Dropbox, Box, those kind of cloud-based um, file storage solutions, but really, I mean, it's it's less when you when you watch the process monitoring at a desktop or on a server. Um, it's taking about a quarter of the of the processing power that traditional antivirus does. So it's it's very lightweight. Interesting. So, in your professional opinion, should these people be paying the ransom on these? ransomware attacks <laughs> so i mean that's a great question and i mean the easy answer is no but it's not that simple um, a lot of times these attackers will also delete the backups and so so to give you give you an example um garmin the gps company they were hit earlier this summer and reportedly, I haven't seen official anything official on this, but reportedly paid a $10 million ransom. And it, they obviously didn't have any other choice. I would say these attackers likely wiped out their backups. Um, and so they didn't, they really didn't have a choice because they couldn't recover from backup. A company like Garmin, they couldn't just recreate that massive amount of data. Um, so at that point, what else can a company do other than pay? And so, and, and actually the um, Department of Homeland Security has started to get involved and has issued warnings that companies like Garmin or any company can't just pay those ransoms because the people that are being paid are not you know, these aren't legitimate US based businesses so they're potentially paying terrorists to to get access to their files back which is not legal to pay terrorists for anything no matter what it is so that, so there's a lot of complicated issues that go into whether a company should pay a ransom or not and and certainly shouldn't but Sometimes there's just no alternative. And, and even government entities have paid ransoms. So um, we, have, we have an employee that worked for Lake City, Florida, and they were hit by a ransomware attack and 
paid and they wiped out their backups as part of that attack. Uh, and they paid a four hundred and sixty thousand dollar ransom as a as a city government. Um, so it, it's not just individual companies paying, but it's government, nonprofit, hospitals. It's it's all kinds of entities. So it's very complicated in, in whether companies should or shouldn't pay. Wow. So the little guy like me and the mom and pops sitting around their little desktop computers, we get terrified when we hear about this big ransomware thing. You have what you call a ransomware response kit on your website. Would that help people like me and mom and pop? Um, so it would help just in the in giving you some direction on what what you can do to identify and deal with the attack after it's happened. Um, the best thing to do, though, is to not put yourself in that position. Um, and, and again, this isn't something where we as individuals or as companies can't do anything about because we absolutely can. So as individuals, um, some of the basic things that absolutely should be done on, on your PCs is to, number one, make sure you do have a backup, make sure that it is it's a cloud-based backup and not just a drive that's always connected to your device because what will happen if that, so if you, you know, everyone should have a backup for sure, right? Um, so A, do that, but then make sure that that's not just an external USB drive or some, a drive that's always connected. And the best way is to have that be an offsite online backup that just happens automatically, has a unique password that's separate from anything else that you use and is cloud-based so that if an attack happens, it can't also attack that separated backup. So backup is number one. Second thing is patching. So everyone's probably seen the pop-ups that say, oh, you need to update Windows, or you need to update this application, or you need to update Microsoft Office, you definitely want to run those updates and set your system so that it automatically runs the updates. The most common way that that these attacks come through is through vulnerabilities in systems that are that are already installed on your computer. So the the attack with the the law firm that we're working with came through as a word document attachment and then that attachment it exploited a vulnerability in Microsoft Word that allowed the attack then to run and that's that can be stopped by having the system completely up to date so patch management, uh, making sure that all of the applications and the operating system are up to date goes that actually today, I mean, goes further, in my opinion, than antivirus. Um, so the third thing is to make sure you do have antivirus and make sure it is up to date. Um, but those are those are three simple things that every person that has a, a computer and files that they want to keep should be doing backup make sure it's separated has its own password patch management making sure all of the applications and your operating system are up to date and then up to date antivirus uh, and making sure it stays up to date and then on top of that all of that add crypto stopper that's some good advice so from one bad thing to another let's shift to what you're experiencing in your area the derecho, that is a land hurricane. Could you tell people about what is actually happening, the yep. situation down in your area? Yeah, so we're so I'm located in in Iowa, um, near Cedar Rapids, Iowa. <laughs> so yep. as you can imagine, being in the middle of Iowa, uh, a hurricane is not something that we 
think is ever going to happen. And I'd never heard of a derecho before this event. Um, I, you know, they've obviously happened before, but it's not a very common occurrence. And we have, we have lots of thunderstorms. I mean, having a thunderstorm in the Midwest is very common. Uh, and that particular day, I believe it was August 10th, may have been August 11th, either way. Um, I was, have been working from home and, and still working from home from the pandemic. And I uh, took my dogs out for a walk. I knew I'd looked at the radar and I saw that this thunderstorm was coming, um, but no, no major warnings. I mean, we have tornado warnings and severe thunderstorm warnings, um, no warnings, but I could see this on the radar, um, this rain that was coming. And so I wanted to take my dogs out for a little walk. I live on a small farm here in Iowa with uh, about 50 acres and took the dogs out and went up. We have a big hill on our property and I was up at the top of this hill and I could see I'm guessing it was about two miles away. I could see just this black wall of clouds coming at us. And so started thinking, okay, well, this looks a little more severe than just rain and started jogging toward the house. And I look, look back and it's just bearing down on us. So I start running to the house. And just as I get the, get, with two big labs, um, just as I get the labs into the house, the wind just starts blowing like like nothing I've ever experienced. And and I've heard in a tornado, which are pretty common here in the Midwest, um, that it sounds like a, a train coming by, and that's exactly like what this wind sounded like. It sounded like a like you were right next to a train coming by. And so I got into the house safely, um, get go into my basement, because I think it's, a, I thought that it was a tornado. Um, but you couldn't see, I mean, we, it's pretty open here, and there wasn't a funnel cloud or anything. Um, but I was obviously hurrying to get into the basement, got into the basement, and just, you could just hear this train sound for it lasted about 30 minutes. Um, and finally, once, once everything stopped, I came out of, came out of my uh, basement bunker and looked outside. I mean, there were trees, trees down, lots of branches. We didn't have a, a ton of trees completely down in our, on our property, but lots of branches down everywhere. Um, part of our, our roof actually came off and we had water damage in the house. Uh, and so I thought, okay, well that, and it still didn't know that this was a derecho at that point. And there weren't any, I didn't hear any sirens going off. I mean, we live far enough out in the country that um, typically when there's an emergency event, you can hear sirens from the, the towns that are around us. Didn't, didn't hear any of that beforehand, really had no warning that this was coming. So I really didn't know exactly what had happened. Um, still, at that point, thought it was some sort of tornado event that just hit hit our property. But then, as and power was out at this point, so no, you know, no connectivity to the outside world other than my my phone was still working. So I started to see reports of that this derecho hit, and went to went, then went to leave and there were trees down across our our driveway so i helped um help my neighbor clear their driveway and our driveway with chainsaws and got you know out into the community and then um finally drove into cedar rapids and it i, I mean devastation is really all the only way that I can describe it. I mean, it. If anyone's ever seen a what it looks like after a tornado comes through, that's what it looked like across the entire town. There were, and now the the reports are that fifty to seventy five percent of the tree canopy in the city of Cedar Rapids, and this is a community of um, about one hundred and twenty thousand in the metro area. A couple couple of small towns combined. Um, so about 120,000. And 
it looks like it still looks like a tornado came through the whole town so this was about a a 40 mile wide area where this this windstorm came through and and we were without power uh for a full six days at our house i luckily have a, a generator so we were at least had some power um but there were there were places in cedar rapids you know you, as you can imagine apartment buildings where people didn't have a basement to go to or didn't have you know that that were just destroyed there were literally i mean there were people living in tents for for days after that event and there were there were there were certainly some humanitarian issues that I would have never thought that I would have seen in in my own community and and hel- I helped um helped in the local community as much as I could volunteering and and donating um I mean simple things like water and food and diapers that that people needed so um yeah it's it's has been a a pretty horrible event but I would say as Iowans we we pulled together and have gotten through and FEMA did finally get involved. Um, it took several days. I, don't, I, I think that the federal government, even our, our state government, didn't, it initially didn't realize how bad it was um, until several days after. And, and at this point, I mean, we're primarily recovered. I would say there's probably lots of people in Cedar Rapids, if they heard me say that, would, uh, would not be happy. Um, still a long way to go. But um, at least from a humanitarian and and public safety standpoint, um, things are 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 back to at least safe. Let's talk about that just a little bit more. On let's compare that to the response with Katrina and it, with the COVID situation going on. How did that play factor in the response to this? Yeah, so I don't know if that slowed things down. Um, I know um, I, I worked with several different organizations, and you know people were wearing masks, and I, I would say it, it certainly slowed the response down because of COVID and made it more complicated. But I wouldn't. I, I don't think that I would compare it to Katrina, in that it, there weren't. Any, at least that I'm aware of, there weren't any deaths after the event. There were, I believe there were three deaths during the event, Um, but there weren't any deaths after the event. So people were taking care of each other. Um, And so from that, that standpoint, I mean, I think that the recovery was certainly better and nowhere nowhere near at least in in my opinion others may disagree with me but i i I don't think it was nearly as bad as um as an event like katrina and we've had floods we actually had a a massive flood in 2008 in cedar rapids um but there wasn't the flooding event like there was in in katrina and people weren't cut off i mean there were i guess there were streets that were cut off because there were trees i mean these massive trees and old growth neighborhoods um where people i mean couldn't get through until people came through with chainsaws and cleared it but but at least there weren't any deaths after the event from um from a humanitarian standpoint if there are still relief efforts, how can people get involved with that if they want to get involved? Um, so I would I would say the Red Cross would be um, a great place to to look. Um, and I don't know. I think all of the local organizations. I want to kind of end this on a lighter note. I read that you're a experimental aircraft builder. Yes. Yeah. So So. what is that like building (laughs) your own aircraft and then flying it for the first time? Yeah. So, uh, so we actually hired, so a a partner of mine and I built the, built the airplane and it's, it's a Lance Air uh, 360 is the type and model of aircraft. And I actually 
didn't even have my pilot's license when uh, when we started working on it. And the the first flight that I took in it was actually after. So we hired a test pilot uh, to come and and inspect the plane after um, after we had everything to the point where it's working, um, it had done all of our inspections, and then hired a test pilot to come inspect our our work, uh, and then have them be the <laughs> the uh, the test pilot to go take that very first flight, um, and then my first flight in the plane, um, it, it definitely a um, hair raising. To, to say the least, um, but I was I was very prepared for it and had the the professional test pilot with me at that point and did um, did about a week's worth of training prior to the event of actually going and flying. So I was I was very prepared um, for that first flight. But that being said, you, you can't. Uh, it can't completely prepare for that experience of when you hit the throttle and go airborne in a in a plane that you've built yourself. Um, and it's it's a it's a very cool little plane. It's a two two passenger plane, so it's tiny, um, but it goes about 230 miles an hour. Uh, so you can you can really get from point A to point B very quickly. So yeah, I mean it, it's a an exhilarating. I mean just just being able to be a private pilot and fly a what are called certified. So there's two categories of general aviation aircraft, uh, certified and experimental. And to fly a, a, a certified Cessna or a Piper that's a, a manufactured product uh, is exhilarating in itself. But then to actually go and fly something that you've built with your own hands um, is a pretty amazing experience. That's one of those experiences a lot of people don't get the chance to reach out and get involved. I had the opportunity to work for Mike Howell. He was a flying tiger and excellent pilot, and he got me involved in helping him build his experimental aircraft and taught me yep. how to fly the Cessna. And it's an experience everybody should experience. I just wanted to touch base on that because it's a great experience to have. Absolutely. How can people reach out to you, get involved, and look more at what you do, Greg? Yeah, so our website is getcryptostopper.com, and people can email me directly at gedwards at getcryptostopper.com. All right, Greg. I thank you for your time today, and thank you for being on Dead America Podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Ed. Thank you for joining us today. If you found this podcast enlightening, entertaining, educational in any way, please share, like, subscribe, and join us right back here next week for another great episode of Dead America Podcast. I'm Ed Waters, your host. Enjoy your afternoon, wherever you may be.